Before I get started, I want to get, give people a couple minutes, but let me ask a question about yesterday. Did anyone have the time? I know how it is at summer school, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, did anyone have the time to look at the, my question for you about dynamic dispatch? So we were mentioning that you could take the dispatch matrix and sort of organize it. One way to think about it is either row major or column major order, depending on, depending on how you decide to look at it. So, uh, so one version was we said, well, an object in that terminology, you give it instant data of a class and it will create a tuple of methods that operate on you know, that, that data. Or I can instead say, no, 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 I give you the instant data and you make a sum and then the methods dispatch on that sum type. So I gave you two organizations. You can just look at those as the matrix and it's transpose if you like. Uh, if you if you think of it as a as a vector of vectors in a certain way, then then you can uh, think of it in terms of the transpose. So you're going to kind of the dual space, which is exactly what's going on. So that's why why it's a kind of fun example to think about. So what I asked you to consider was about the implications for maintaining code, and I was saying that if you represent it as the objects, an object is a sum of classes, that is this big sum type, then when I add new classes, I immediately get the type checker to flag for me all the places I have to update because I've added a new class. That's kind of a, a nice virtue. But the other way, which is the more common one that it's explained in like Java or something, you get back a tuple of methods. And so what I was, when you do a new, you get back a tuple of methods. So the question I was asking is what property does that help you with? That representation help you with as regards modifying your program? Does anybody have a quick answer to that? It only takes a few minutes thought, but. Okay, I'll answer for myself then if nobody else wants to jump in. Uh, the idea, oh yes, we can make sure, yeah, good. Uh, someone gave more or less the answer I wanted. It protects you against method message not understood, which is the typical fake error message that you have. That is you can select, if you delete a method, say if your maintenance mode is I delete a method, now I have a tuple with something missing and what am I supposed to do with that? And so the type checker will tell you that, oh, you don't, you're missing your method. So in that organization, you sort of have a nice helper as far as telling you if you've deleted a method where, you know, what, what you have to do to compensate for that. On the other hand, uh, or, it, yeah, or another way to say it is, I have a tuple with a missing field and you, all the places where you project from it that is send a message of that field would be quotes misunderstood and the type checker tells you that's a type error. So those are the spots where you have to correct. So it's sort of dual, you can either be robust under adding new classes, or you can be robust under subtracting methods. Uh, that's just a fact. That's just like, you just work it out in the way I told you. And I think what it is telling you is neither organization is somehow superior or more intrinsic or somehow uniformly better than the other. And latching onto one and insisting that that's the one true way, for that reason, seems to me to be wrongheaded. And so the message about type theory is, do what you like. I gave you three types and said they're all isomorphic. You can change between them as the case may be by moving along those isomorphisms. It's a very natural thing to do. So, so there, it's an example in a small way of the idea that type theory tells you what the right thing to do is. And you could ask, how do I know that's the right thing? Well, there are different forms of evidence that you can that you can uh, bring to bear. But the one that I kind of fall back on all the time is this principle of Trinitarianism, which says that type theory, category theory, and logic are all sort of three perspectives on the same, on the same thing. So the idea is that if you have a, a concept that makes sense as a programming concept, makes sense in terms of categories or algebraic structures or something, makes sense in terms of logic, then you sort of figure, that's a real thing. Like that's the best criterion we have of knowing that you discovered something of enduring value. There's that, that, that's it. It's a methodological consideration, but it has quite a, quite a scope of applicability. That is, it sweeps up a lot of ideas into 
in a uniform way. That's the whole idea about type theory and the whole idea about constructivism and all everything associated with type theory. And that's a rather beautiful thing because you can kind of rely on it as you know, your guide to like, what is the right answer to certain, certain kinds of problems. And remarkably, what you notice is the type theoretically right answer when you play out what it means methodologically in terms of writing code, uh, in my experience has been, it's always, it, 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 it gives you something you really want. And so I think that's uh, maybe some meta lesson I could remark on, but let me just, let me just stop there. Okay, so what I wanted to do is um, today is talk about Plotkin's PCF, and uh, which I, I remarked up here. I've forgotten who actually said this, but it, it, it has been sometimes described as the uh, E. coli of programming languages, you know, the, the universal subject of study, you know, this E. coli is some intestinal bacterium or something that used for bazillions of studies of various kinds. And it's kind of true that PCF is a certain resting point that it is a nice jumping off point for studying lots of issues. And I will explain, I'll do that for you today, like show you how one thing leads to another. I'm got, my, my intention here is to take you through a series of ideas that feel to me inevitable that just fall out of a kind of type theoretic analysis of what's going on. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So the general idea is that we looked at Goodall's T, which has, you know, very endless extensions, I called it T plus plus. Really, I will be talking about PCF plus plus. In fact, I will be talking about different variations. So just to be fair, uh, I call it Plotkin's PCF out of deference to Gordon, but uh, it, it's not literally what I'm doing. It's not literally exactly what that is. It's what I'm considering to be the spirit of it. Okay, just so you know. All right, so the uh, so the idea is that uh, you replace boundary recursion with general recursion. So what happens is the primitive recursor goes away. You just have a conditional branch, which branches on whether a number is zero or not. This is what you do if it's zero. This is what you do if it's a successor and you plug in the predecessor. That's the idea here. Uh, you, you do that. There's no idea of recursive call, but there's, a, there's no reason in the world not to keep your hands on the thing that you're the successor of. And I'll make an analogy here. This little idea of if z, very natural thing, it's directly analogous to the colossal mistake in every OO programming language that I know of to have something called instance of, which lets you check the instance of, you do a conditional branch and gives you a Boolean. Good, now you go into the branch, you say, I know it's an instance of the class C. Well, so what? Now that you're in that branch, the thing you just checked the instance of is still known only to be a generic object. And therefore, when you do like message send and so on, it once again must dispatch on the class. It's like, doesn't make any sense. What's actually happening is that you should be doing a case analysis, which recovers the underlying data and it provides you access to that data. A similar thing happens with the vaunted null pointer. You don't want if X equals null, that's the stupidest idea ever. What you wanna do is if you even want a null pointer, you wanna have an optional value and you wanna case analyze on whether it's there or not. And if it is there, you wanna return, the, you wanna to pass to the appropriate branch the actual underlying value, because why should you drop that on the floor? So there's a tendency, which I've called in an essay called Boolean blindness, to turn everything into a Boolean. You collapse all this information about, let's say, an optional value. You turn it into a Boolean, and like now you're stuck. Like, how are you supposed to get the underlying value? Well, you can't. It, it makes zero sense. If you don't have sums, you can't even think of what you're supposed to do. If you do have sums, it's obvious what you're supposed to do. So it's a, it's a very interesting fact that sums have been this, you know, vastly neglected idea in programming languages, apart from the ML family, things that derive from ML. Anyway, just I thought I would mention that. Okay, so now the key thing that goes on here, which is going to be like the fulcrum of some of my discussion, is the possibility of divergence. The idea that you, you will shortly, as I will show you, be able to write down expressions that have no value. They just loop forever. Of course, 99% of you are familiar with this phenomenon. I'm not pretending that we're not, but I just want to like point out something to you. Let's let's go along, and I will I will you'll see why I'm why I'm mentioning that. So we now have the idea that something can have no value, and that's going to have certain implications about how we reason about programs that I wish to draw out. So that's what I'm really after in the first part of this lecture. So that's why I'm proceeding the way I do. Okay. I want to start though with a little bit of an aside 
it, or it's a motivation for why PCF is defined the way it is, because I'm assuming that I'm teaching to at least some of you who don't already know this. So forgive me if you do. I just want to make sure I'm not losing too many people. That's my hope. So the perspective that's taken in something like PCF is that, like, I, I notice when I teach young students these days that they tend to think of the ability to call yourself recursively as some fact of nature or something. I don't know that that's like not even something to discuss, but actually it's, it's seriously problematic in a certain way. And I want to explain a, a perspective on it, which is reflected in how why PCF is defined the way it is. Okay, so the, the perspective is, if you want to define factor, that's the one we always use because everyone can keep it in their head and it's right in one line. So it's a nice thing. Okay, the perspective I want is that what you're trying to do when you claim that the function factorial, which you could, you could, if you want, take this as a definition because almost any programming language lets you write more or less that. But I want to take this apart a little bit. If I write down an equation like that, it's not immediately clear that it has a solution. So the point is, is that what you're really doing is you're solving. When you say, I write down factorial, this is the property I want. And then I say solve for that, solve for fact. So you're solving, in general, it's a system of equations. And if there are equations that are governing the behavior of functions, then what you're solving for is one or more functions. So that's a way to think about this. So if you're not familiar with that, maybe it'll be useful to you to realize that the circularity of the definition is something that has to be commented on. And I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit later in the lecture. Okay, so the solution, the way the way to understand it is the notion of a fixed point. So this is what I'm what I'm motivating here. So what does it mean to be a solution to an equation like that? Well, what it means is I'm looking for a fixed point of this functional thing called fact, whose type is going to be nat or nat, parens, arrow, nat or nat. And notice I'm writing my arrows differently now because I'm, I'm indicating using Plotkin's notation, in fact, uh, that it's a partial function. So the little piece of the arrow is broken off to remind you that it's a partial function. It might not give a value. In fact, this one will, but I'm just saying in a general, as a general statement. So what you're doing is you're, you're trying to find, you're, you're solving for fact, which means that you want to find a fixed point. That is, you want to solve the equation, fact equals capital fact of fact. That's what we're doing. We want to solve that equation. This is a compact way of doing it. I write fact, which is everything that's written up here except for the self-reference. That's what I've written here with capital fact. And now what I'm doing is I'm looking for a fixed point because you can think of capital fact, so to speak, sort of like an eigenvector, okay? The, the idea is that capital fact is sort of trying to screw you up as it were. And I'm going to claim that no matter how hard you try, you're going to have uh, a fixed point. You're going to have a, an eigenvector, if you will. Okay, that's, that's what the fact is here. But in order to ensure that you always have a fixed point, I have to give up on totality. I have to say you're working only with partial functions. So as long as I say that, then the, such solutions will always exist. And the way you name the solution is using an operation called fix. Oops. And, and, in, and indeed, that's the reason it's called fix, okay? So the primitive operation that we have in, in PCF as compared to Gödel's theory is we get rid of the recursor in favor of ISI because there's no reason to have a for loop if you have while loops. That's basically the idea. If you have general recursion, you don't need to have a separate for loop. Okay, maybe you like it for some reason, but in some theoretical sense, I don't need it. So I get rid of that. So I make all of my looping arise from taking a fixed point from solving a recursion equation. So that's the notion of what fixed, oops, I keep making that mistake. I wish I could avoid it. Um, so I have this guy and that's what I want to do. And the thing I want you to notice is, and now I'm introducing the idea of a transition system on the fly. So what is going to happen here is I'm going to introduce now a deterministic strategy for computing the, for, for doing computation as opposed to just writing down some equation. And the reason is, in the presence of divergence, it matters, okay? So that's the key idea. So the point is, uh, yes, that is the correct, uh, someone said about Harrison said that, yes, uh, regarding uh, conditional. Um, 
So the point is, as a practical matter, uh, what is going to happen to us is we're going to introduce this idea of a fixed point. And if you ignore the transition here momentarily, you can kind of say fix is equal to, well, the substitution of fix for X in E. That is, I unroll it or yeah, replace it by its right-hand side. If I think of, so what I'm looking at is I'm saying here in this notation, I'm saying fact is by definition, the fixed point of capital fact. And the fixed point has the property that it's going to be equal to capital fact applied to itself. So it solves the equation, gives you the solution. Okay, so that's the idea. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna operationalize that using a transition system, which is a particular way of evaluating things. And in order to motivate that, I wanna go back a slide. And I want to say that the central issue that I want to deal with in the first part of this lecture is the question, what is the range of significance of a variable? This is a very important question in language design. Now, the first thing I want to mention about this, why this comes up, is because you'll notice I'm doing a substitution here. I'm plugging in fix for a variable x. And yet I've also said to you that certain of these expressions might diverge. So in particular, if I examine an expression like, if I use that, if I take fix x, x, and you look at that transition, it says, take this whole thing, this whole fix and plug it in for X in here and it goes exactly to itself. And therefore I can keep doing this forever. And so this could be by definition called the divergent expression of type tau. So we now have divergence around. So that's what we're reading here. So by taking the fixed point, it's just sort of saying, well, I want the X such that X is equal to X. Well, in an operational sense of how we are going to execute this as I'm suggesting here, then that means it's just going to run forever because there's no, there's no solution that is a value. There's no value for that. There's just a computation that proceeds endlessly. In fact, now that brings me to the terminology that I wish to introduce. So when dealing with fixed points, when dealing with recursion and fixed points, the, thing, the question that comes up is what is the range of significance of a variable? And there are two sort of interpretations that are in play. One is called by name and the other is called by value. And you notice I'm dropping the word call by. I don't want the word call because it's a mistake to associate the issue with function, with function call. The issue is not to do with function call. The issue is to do with what do variables range over. Now, in ordinary math, like you learned in school, you never had to worry about this. Nobody ever really probably made a big point about this. You can plug in two plus two for X in a polynomial, and you can plug in Y for X in a polynomial. You can plug in seven for X, I don't know, whatever you like. Okay, and nobody worries about that. You just plug it in. And the reason is, is that in math, informally, every expression you can write down is well-defined. Well, except for the fudge that is always made of pretending that division is a function, which is not, it's a partial function. And because it's a partial function, you get all into all the usual conundrum. I'll come back to that a little bit later. The analog here of dividing by zero here is the possibility of diversions. So now the way this is handled in a, in a programming setting is says, well, since you have this possibility of diversions, I must distinguish between the idea that variables range over computations, which might diverge. They're not yet finished. So the idea is that these are, these are you know, so to say, still active as it were. That is, they are not, they're not yet completed. Or you can say that they range over values, which means that they are finished or they're done. They're already have converged as I've written it out here. So they, they, these have already converged as opposed to a possibly divergent thing. So what I'm gonna do is examine fixed points from these two points of view, because it's quite traditional to do it. But here's the thing I want that I hope will bother you. If I have a divergent expression, what does it mean to plug that in for a variable? Like, am I not putting nothing in for something? Like, what is going on here? Okay, I'll come back to that because actually that's a very significant question. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so what happens in Plotkin's uh, formulation, the original is called PCF by name. That's my terminology, just to distinguish uh, the two version I have. And it's literally defined in this way that the primitive step about dealing with fixed point is you plug in a possibly divergent expression, a recursion expression, you plug it in for X and that's how you do it. You unroll the recursion. 
And this, as I've mentioned, is called a transition relation. I'm telling you step-by-step step how to execute things. Why am I doing that? Well, because the by name and the by value interpretations will lead to a very different execution behavior. It's forced on you. As soon as you decide what variables range over, you must commit to certain evaluation order. You can't just say, oh, I don't care. Some equations hold, no, because doing that is analogous to allowing yourself to write one over X and things like that, and then pretending that all the usual equations hold. No, that's not the case because you have something that is undefined. So I have to be careful. So the moment I introduce this ill-definedness, I want to be very careful about exactly how things are done. And the driving force is, what am I allowed to plug in for a variable? That's my first cut. So here with by name, I'm allowed to plug in any computation. So therefore this unrolling makes sense. According, according to that principle, whatever your opinion of it may be, according to the principle that I can plug in computations for variables, then this unrolling makes sense. And it sort of directly expresses the idea that it's uh, solving a recurrence. Okay, that's what's happening here. And now for the sake of discussion, let me point out, all the other constructs now have to be specified exactly how we evaluate them. So if I have an application, I have to figure out which, what function I'm gonna apply before I, before I know what to do. Once I know what that function is, then I can apply it. But in a by name interpretation, the variable, which is the argument to the function, ranges over computation. So I don't bother to evaluate E2, I just plug it right in. This is where the call by part of it comes in. People, this, this thing is literally called call by name, but in my view, the call by is parasitic on the by. <laughs> so first you decide what variables mean, now everything else falls into place. So that's what I'm going to do. And the same thing happens with ITSE, with a conditional branch, I first have to figure out, well, I have to evaluate the number that I'm trying to branch on, because if I don't do that, then I don't even know how to branch. So obviously I have to do this, and that causes this transition to occur. And then once I know that it's zero or successor, fine. And now I plug in the predecessor, which itself might be divergent. And I'm gonna come back to that. Well, why might it be divergent? Well, because you have some choices here. And the choice is whether or not the, the terminology that comes up is, is the successor strict or not? Do I demand that the argument be a value before the successor is a value or do I not? And you can have it both ways. And that decision is not so much forced by the semantics of variables, although you will run into it here because uh, in a call by value setting, you won't be able to do that if this is lazy. And I'm gonna show you how to sort all this out, but I just wanna point this out right now. So in the general case, there's no requirement that E, e could be divergent. You're allowed to take the successor of divergence. So again, if something should be a little uncomfortable because you're taking the successor of something that doesn't exist. Well, all right, anyway, carry on. Okay, you see, I'm trying to provoke some thoughts in you because there's a tendency to think of these and these concepts in terms of how they're implemented. And then that puts the cart before the horse. I first wanna get what is the conceptual issue, then we'll talk about how you implement it. Okay, that's the key idea. Okay, so that's why I'm, why I'm behaving this way. I have a certain theatrical purpose okay, that, I, I want to, that I want to carry out here. So the point is the E could be divergent and I can plug in a divergent thing for a variable so everything hangs together. So that's the idea. So if you do this, then I can write factorial using fixed in the following way, okay? I can just take a fixed point and it's kind of customary, especially in a lot of well-known programming languages to use a word like self or another word like this. Uh, I can say this is also known as this or, or words like that to name the variable that you are taking the fixed point of the functional that you're taking a fixed point of. Why? Because that's how you call yourself. See, the idea of self is, there's no magic to the idea of self, like in Java or something, they act like there's ooga booga about self. There's all sorts of ooga booga. That's like, I, I'm like, God, these people are crazy. Okay, what's going on is you're taking a fixed point. Okay, and they're trying, and then the whole, many issues like involving inheritance involve when do you take a fixed point, but let me not go there, okay? It's never taught to you this way, but it ought to be. Like high school APCS is a travesty, while I inject my opinions, uh, because they don't teach these beautiful ideas. Instead, they teach you some crap about programming with Java. It's useless because it has no intellectual value. You would like the CSAP to be, at least in the US, I don't, I don't know about other countries, so, but the, uh, the uh, 
I, I would like it to be comparable to, you know, AP calculus or AP physics or something, but it's not. Instead, it's just like some rubbish. Okay. Well, anyway, enough about that. Okay. So, so the idea is that I give the, I give a name to, to itself because I want to call myself. And so I call itself, or I could call it this if I want. So another common thing is you call it this. Okay. Fair enough. So the entire point I want to make is that it's just an issue an instance of using these fixed points. So it relies on substitution because I can write a broken version of fact in which let's say I made that be X instead of X prime and I, I didn't do the predecessor. Well, then it's gonna loop intuitively, right? Because uh, nothing's ever going down. So there's no argument that something is well-founded and, and they you know, can do this. Uh, they use Java as far as I'm aware in APCS. Uh, uh, if, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, so the, the um, uh, so the point is, that, let's say this were X, then it would be a diversion thing because self applied to X is not gonna have a value because it's just gonna keep going around and let, yet I'm allowed to substitute for it. And the thing I, I've already alluded to, I wanna call to mind like some crazy things, you know, somewhere along the way, somebody will show you crazy things you can do if you start pretending that division is a function, that is everything is well-defined because then you could say, well, I don't know, one over zero times zero should be one, right? Because division is the inverse of multiplication. <coughs> All right, so it's like completely doesn't make sense. All right, so it's an analogous thing comes up here, okay? But the idea of substituting nothing for something. Okay, I, I wanna set that aside, but uh, because, uh, but if I wanna make a point, which is that the PCF by name could be thought of as the ultra tiny, tiniest core of core of a language like Haskell, where variables are, 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 are the range of significance of variables at computation. I'll come back to that a little bit later. And I will say, you should feel uncomfortable about that. If you're thinking in terms of how things are compiled, but let's not worry about that, I'll get back to it. I'll show you the systematic way to derive these things. Okay, let's look at another way we could organize PCF, which is not what Plotkin did, but I'll still call it PCF, I'll call it PCF by value. So the idea now is I'm going to say that variables range only over, over values. You're not allowed to plug in something undefined for a variable or po potentially undefined for a variable. You must first of all re realize that it's defined before you're allowed to plug it in. Now there are gonna be different ways to handle this phenomenon, but the first one I'll mention to you is one that you will run across commonly. And the idea is you say, okay, if I'm gonna do that, then I have to give up on this general idea of fix because the most general idea of fix, which is unrestricted, I can use this at any type tau, and I can do it for any expression E, relies on this unrolling and substitution, which is questionable. Okay, so if I'm going to demand that variables range only over values, which is like, okay, I don't know, a, a way of thinking about things, then, then what I will do is, instead of having a general recursion, I will then introduce certain recursively defined things, which are themselves values. And the canonical thing is a function. And the idea is that I can write down a function, I can generalize a lambda to be a lambda that has a name for itself. And I've written it here fun because it's more or less reminiscent of notation you see like in a standard ML or OCaml, uh, for example. Okay, so you can write it down like that. So the idea I have a name for itself and the idea is such a fun as a value. And then it's a matter of application ensures that it plugs in the thing for itself for F before executing the body. So it keeps one step ahead of your recursive function because by the time you call it with an argument, that's X, it's first arranged to plug in the function itself for F so you never know the difference. So that if you then get to the branch where you're doing a recursive call, you'll once again see the fun. So that's the, the whole idea. So now we have recursive functions, which are values, but we don't have recursive function computations, which are non-valued. Because in a by-value setting, you don't have any choice, okay? That's the idea. And moreover, I'll mention, which I've highlighted here, is that once you're committed to variables being values, then the variable, which stands for the argument of the function, must itself also be a value. That's again where the call by comes in. But the call by part is parasitic on the fact that I a priori decided that variables range over values. And therefore I have to do this. I can't plug in E2 all by itself because it might be diversion, for example. So I first want to figure out what its value is, and then I do that. 
So that's the, the way in which that works, okay? So if I want to be kind of uh, explicit about that, it means that in the by value setting, I have to have a rule that says, uh, not only do I evaluate the function position of an application before I go on. So this we already have. This is, this is uh, you could say, a shared between the by value and by name versions. But the other thing you need in the by value setting is before you can do an application, you also have to evaluate the argument and that's the call by. And the reason for this is, and you only do this once you've already figured out what the function is. And then you say this, then you get to E2 prime. Okay, so this is the call by part of call by value because we're doing the call or the application in a way that the argument has to be evaluated first in order to ensure that when I actually do the application of the function, what I plug in for X really is a value. So that's what I'm, what I'm doing here. And then we do similar things with, uh, with uh, successor and so on. So successor would have to be strict. So successor, successor would be strict. I'm not gonna write down the rules for this, but you can write them down for yourself. For the same reason, because when you conditional branch, when you plug in the predecessor, you want that to be a value. Okay, so that's the the natural setting. Okay, so those are like two approaches, and I just want to, at this stage of the lecture, all I'm all I'm saying is empirically there are two ways of doing things in the world. I'm illustrating it by this tiny little um, E. coli language PCF, but it re reflects the reality of what is going on. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's some old terminology somebody brought up, but I, I'm not going to, I, I am abandoning that. It, it, yeah, the issue is what, uh, yeah, not, but, okay, uh, that's my, my non-answer. Okay, so I, at this moment, I just want to get across that there are two ways of doing it in the world, and you're going to run across them. Now I want to say something about that state of affairs. Okay, all right, so first of all, are we okay with this? You understand what is happening? So for example, in PCF by name, if I have an application of let's say lambda x 17, I don't know, just a constant function, and I apply that to diverge, well, that will in fact step to 17. If I'm in PCF by value, this very expression is divergent because it has to evaluate the argument and it won't succeed in doing that because I chose the argument to be undefined. This is often considered to be a feature of by name interpretation, whereas I consider it to be a bug. And I'm going to explain why I consider that a little bit later. So that's the idea. Okay, so that's a uh, thing I want to point out. So this is often considered to be a virtue and curiously enough, it's often considered to be a virtue because it's more mathematical. Well, I understand what is meant when people say that, and I'm not going to elaborate on that point. It has to do with the universal properties of the type constructor, but the, the God's honest truth is there's nothing mathematical about plugging in one over zero for X, and then you find yourself in some weird conundrum uh, because you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> in a certain sense, math is called by value. So it's very peculiar that by name is justified on mathematical grounds, if you ask me. That is my argument in any case, whether you believe me or not. Okay, I wanna make an aside here because I don't, want, I don't wish to dwell on it, but what I have done so far is I said that once we have divergence, you see, we have this discrepancy between the two approaches. So the order in which I evaluate things and which how I evaluate things is determined by the a priori decision to, to specify the range of significance of a variable. And so, so I do that by having these, this transition system, which tells me exactly the order in which you're supposed to simplify. So that's an execution model. And <clears throat> The requirement to have an execution model like this stems from the fact that divergence, the terminology is a kind of an effect. And I think that terminology probably was invented by Eugenio Moji, but in any case, he's the one who studied it in a very insightful way that will come up a little bit later. Okay, so, the, uh, so I just wanna mention, it's effects that give rise to the need to specify an evaluation part. If you don't, then you know, willy nilly do whatever you like, who cares? Because it's all gonna be the same. Well, I'll put an asterisk there having to do with cost, but let me leave that aside for right now. Okay, so the thing I want to say just this is almost really just as an aside right now. I just want to say that 
the notion of type safety, which I alluded to earlier, now comes up in connection with these transition systems. And the idea is the following thing, is we have two properties that kind of go together, forming a kind of pas de deux, that the, the two dancers are going to hand off one from the other in order to achieve a certain property. And the property is that you don't get any bus errors. So what I want to do is, at an abstract level, tell you, you're never going to get bus error core dump. That's what I want to do. So how do I express the concept of bus error core dump? Well, what I say is, I'm going to claim that if you have a well-typed program, the, my, my intention here is, if I have a well-typed program, then it will never be the case that it can run for a little while and then find itself in an ill-defined state. Another way to say it is, no illegal instructions. Okay, It will always proceed. So how do we how do we express this? How do we derive this? Well, a nice clean way to formulate it is the conjunction of two properties called preservation and progress. So the preservation theorem says if I start with a program and I make a step, I go from E to E prime, and E is well typed, then E prime is well typed, but not only that, it has the same type. Okay, so that's the first point. And you can prove this by induction. You the, the transition relation I sketched is inductively defined by a collection of rules. So you do a rule for rule induction on the transition. You look at all the rules for transition and you verify in each case that if E has type tau, then E prime also has type tau. And you go through each of the rules of the execution and verify that's the case. And that's the preservation theorem. The typing is preserved under the transition. That's the terminology. Then there's a kind of complementary property that says if things are well typed, then either they're already done or they can take a step. And here is existing E prime is implicit. That is, I'm either in a well-defined final state, I've terminated properly, or else I can, I can make progress. That's the, where the terminology of the progress theorem, I can make progress because there exists a next state. And how do you prove that? Well, the only way you could possibly do it, given the statement of the theorem, it's by induction on typing. Go, go through all the typing rules, one by one by one by one, and verify that this is the case. I'm not gonna do it for you. You can look it up in PFPL, it's written down there. So you notice how these two guys play together. Preservation says, if you take a step from a well-typed expression, it's well-typed. If it's well-typed, then it's either done or can take another step, in which case that E prime is well-typed and we carry on and on and on. We go back and forth in a pot to do between the two theorems, okay? Any step leads to, from a well-typed step leads to a well-typed thing. The well-typed thing is either a value or it can take another step. Oh, but then what it steps to, the E double prime is well-typed and so on. So that's the way you do it. And the idea is that the reason there are no bus errors is you are assuming that you stay within bounds that everything remains well-behaved and this scenario can never arise. So that's the idea. So the thing I've mentioned before is that this notion of safety is in my mind, just a hygiene condition. You wrote down a static, the type system for programming language. You wrote down how to execute it. You should check that what you did makes sense because you know you can make mistakes. If you have a real language, you're gonna have hundreds of rules, okay? You have to check that, that this is all works. And in fact, the way you do that is mechanization. But as I mentioned in the last lecture, if you want to do mechanization, you should first of all understand what you're mechanizing. The mechanization helps you get it right, that's for sure. Very, very useful, especially for maintaining a language. But the but the but the here's the main point of what you're doing. This is the idea of it. And so to my mind, safety is like something you cannot sacrifice. This is just like fundamental to saying you know what you're doing. If you look at all the languages that are out there, almost none of them even have a definition. So the whole subject doesn't even come up because you don't have a definition. For many languages, almost, almost everyone I can think of, if you were to give it a definition according to what people seem to say about it, you will find this not safe. Scala is an example of that. Haskell is an example of that. So the, the, the social phenomenon is people then resist giving a definition to languages which are not safe because it's a slippery slope, you see. Because as soon as I tell you what the language actually is, and I tell you what its stacks is and what its dynamics is, then um, 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 they don't fit together. And now what am I supposed to say? Well, the only move in town is to say, oh, I don't want 
forget all this, forget definition. I don't want to do language definition. The language is whatever my compiler is doing this week. Well, that's all right as long as you don't ever think you're going to reason about your programs. Okay. So if you want to have some way of reasoning, a classic one that's going to come up in connection with Godel's T, in fact, Godel's T was motivated by this, or with PCF or any programming language you do, is you want to prove some property of your code. So let's say you have a function whose domain is a natural numbers, factorial, for example. Okay, I want to prove something about it possibly by doing mathematical induction. I want to reason about all of the values of natural number type by splitting it up into two cases, zero successor. Oh, now comes the second problem. So PCF by name is well-defined. PCF by value is well-defined. They're both type safe languages. But that doesn't mean they're like they're like equally good because if you do things by name, if you think about it carefully, you suddenly realize the principle of mathematical induction is never applicable because there is no type of natural numbers. Oh, I know it's called the type of natural numbers. It's called the type of list. It's called the type of Booleans. But in no case is it the Booleans or the list or the natural numbers, that's a lie. Now you can say I can call it any, anything I want. Okay, you could call it, you know, my bicycle instead of natural numbers. Uh, but generally speaking, you're choosing names that are suggestive. And if you choose the name Nat or Bool for something that isn't the natural numbers or Boolean, you're just inviting mistake. So why is it that mathematical induction is not valid under by name? Well, because look at all of the things that I can write down that are values in the by name interpretation. Divergence itself is a value, okay? Zero is a value, successor of divergence is a value. Successor of zero is a value, the double successor of divergence. All of these things are values, okay? So the point is, you can see it right in front of you, that's why I wrote it down directly in front of you, is that there are more things here than the mere natural numbers. Therefore, reasoning by mathematical induction is not going to help because you see, when you're doing a proof by mathematical induction, you're looking at a mapping out property. You have a variable ranging over now. And then I wanna say for every X, something or other P of X, and you say, oh, therefore I, I suffice to show P of zero and P of successor, et cetera, the usual way. But I can't do that here because variables range over computation. And the computations include divergence and they include embedded divergence. So you're completely screwed. If you're in by name, you don't have NAT, you don't have bool, you don't have list, you don't have tree, you don't have AST because induction is never valid. So the point I wanna mention here is that, no, and the answer is no, you do not have a type of natural numbers and you cannot if you have a by name, by name language, you are screwed. So I, I just want to make sure that people understand this because my observation has been uh, that if I tell people who are not, haven't, haven't studied carefully with the semantics of what is going on, they often think either I, I'm wrong or I don't know what, but they find it very objectionable, which tells me that they don't actually understand what's going on. So being a teacher, I'm sort of trying to convey to you what is really going on. If you have a by name value, you don't have any inductive types, okay? Now, okay, so I, I just want to mention that. Another counter move that comes up is people say, well, but I do have co-inductive types. Well, that's true. And I'm not going to develop that here. But anyway, that's not my question. <laughs> you can't change the subject and say, look over here. I mean, what kind of a programming language does not have Booleans for God's sake? You don't have bits. It's insane, okay? But anyway, that's the way it is. All right, so I wanna point that out. All right, so having done that, what I now want to do is to shed some light on what is going on here. And what I wanna do is to revisit this idea of plugging in a computation for a variable because it's a little weird to allow yourself to plug in nothing for something. And the, okay, so, so all right. I mean, I hope you can at least feel that at some level, like the, something a little odd there. And what I'm going to do is explain in what sense that makes, in what way that makes sense. And in doing so, I will reveal 
that the type of the natural number, the type that is called nat is not the type nat. And so I'm going to explain that. So in other words, the issues about the distinction between call by name and call by value can be, instead of those being some arbitrary decision that I made, which in the first part of this lecture I did, I just said to you, if you look around the world, there are two things you can do. Now I wanna systematically analyze the scenario in a, in a bit, bit more careful way, such that the distinctions emerge as a matter of typing, which puts them under control of the programmer rather than the language designer. So my critique is, you don't want the language designer telling you that all variables range over computations because that person has now screwed you. You don't have Booleans, you don't have lists, you don't have trees, okay, they don't exist. What is a good thing to do is to put at your disposal the possibility of achieving the same ends using a richer type structure. That's the point I wanna make in this, in this account that I'm going to give here. So I'm gonna call this unified uh, PCL. So what I'm saying is, as I just remarked, rather than impose an evaluation order, oops, rather than impose an evaluation order, what I wanna do is express the idea that, there's, that there is an evaluation order using a richer type system. That's the whole idea. And I'm doing this for pedagogical purpose because this is gonna lead me into several other things in this lecture and in the next lecture as well. So I have a trajectory in mind here. So in case you're wondering. So I, I want to formulate things in this manner for lots of reasons. Okay, but my starting point is, let's make evaluation order explicit. And the way I do it is, I introduce two notions of values and computations into the programming language. And I have two different notions of typing. The, I'll use the colon that people do for values, and I'll use this kind of colon twiddle, a weak typing, I don't know what else to call it, um, for computations. So the idea is that the intuition you're supposed to have is E positively, affirmatively will evaluate to a value of type tau. This says, well, if M actually terminates, then it will terminate with a value of type tau. It's a weaker typing assertion. That's what I want to say. So it's a computation that might diverge. That's what I want to, what I want to mention here. And therefore, in, in the formulation that I'm giving here for my purposes, is I'm just saying, look, it's a matter of a typing judgment. Let's separate computations from values. This is really useful because what is going to happen here is I'm gonna be able to reproduce the by name phenomena and I'm gonna be able to reproduce the by value phenomena and they will not get in each other's way. You can have it both ways. Having it both ways is better than having one way forced on you. That's the idea. So the setup here is that variables do range only over values. That is uh, important. I'm gonna insist on that. And the idea about computation is that they impose on you this sequencing, that is this specified order of evaluation, rather than it being dictated from outside, it's going to be part of the way you program. So that's the setup that I'm, that I'm doing here. So the computations automatic, uh, by their very nature, as I will show you, uh, sequence computation, do things in a specific order. And the way we achieve that is using something called the lax modality. Now, I'm going to work in terms of lax modality, but I feel like I ought to mention to, uh, to uh, I think an even better way to do things, but I decided not to discuss it here, is what is called call by push value. Personally, I don't find that terminology very mnemonic, but anyway, that's what it's called, uh, which is a even subtler analysis than the lax modality that distinguishes positive and negative types in a useful way. Okay, I'll just, I'll just point out that such a thing exists and I, I'm not going to say anything more about it. Uh, I'm instead going to use this notion of a lax modality. So that's what's going to happen. So notice again, I mean, the idea of a modality, uh, it's pretty commonplace in programming language context these days, but historically it was something that the philosophers did about logic. So the origins were like necessary truth and possible truth, you know, there exists a world in which, uh, you know, I don't know what, I didn't uh, fall off my bike the other day. I don't know, something like that. So uh, these were modes of truth. So this is this idea of modality has been taken over and adopted in type theory in a big way, many applications and the lax modality is the one I wish to talk about today. 
So here's the idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a kind of mutual kind of uh, kind of a symmetry, not exactly a symmetry, but a kind of way in which the the two modes, the the modes for values and the modes for computation interact. So the idea is that the most basic form of computation that's being flagged here by the weak typing symbol is returning an expression which is going to evaluate to a value. So if E really is something that is value, a value or valuable, that is yields a value of type tau, maybe tau is natural number, then return of E is a computation that will return that value. So remember, being a computation allows for the possibility of diversion, but doesn't insist on it. So if I simply return seven, that's perfectly good possibly diversion computation that doesn't happen to diverge. That, that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. And I'm using the notation of return because this is commonly used for this in this kind of setting. So I'm, ad, I'm, ad, I'm adapting that to the present circumstances. Now the modality, the type of the, the modality comes in. Tau comp is the lax modality. That's the terminology. I'm using, and what it is, is the type of encapsulated computations. And you'll notice here we went from strict to weak typing. Here we go from weak, ouch. Here we go from, uh, uh, from weak to strict typing, but by introducing a modality. So the type changes, okay? That's what's important, okay? So we have an encapsulated computation, which is going to be a value of type tau comp. I make the value distinction. Why do I want to do that? Well, it'll become apparent in a moment. The idea, well, I can say it now. The idea of substituting some, nothing for something can be glossed as, I first take the possibly divergent computation M, block evaluation of it and treat it as a value. And that's what I plug in for the variable. That's what's actually going on here. So whether it's a by name or a by value language, I claim, you are inherently only ever substituting values for variable. It's an illusion. When you think you're substituting a non-value for a variable, what you're really doing is the variable doesn't have the type you think it has, it has a related type. Instead of being mat, it's a mat comp. That's the whole idea. If you make this little move, everything falls into place in a natural way. And that's what I kind of want to explain to you here. Okay, so this is the introductory form for the tau comp modality, and here is the eliminatory form. The eliminatory form is sequencing. It's called BIME. That's common in the literature. Uh, it's uh, no matter how it's spelled, but some version of something called BIME or LED is very common in programming languages and Haskell and ML and so on. It could be called LED. It could be called uh, VAL. It could be called BIME. I don't know. There are probably other versions of it as well. Okay. So, but here I've set it up so that it's the elimination form for the modality. So if I have something which is an encapsulated computation, then the idea is that bind is going to run it and then take its value if it has one and pass it to this possibly divergent computation M, which is the body of the bind. And that's explained right here. So the idea is that if I'm binding a computation, which is a return of a value that's already been fully evaluated, I need other rules to supplement this, but the Critical one is if I'm returning a value, if the encapsulated computation has in fact achieved a value, then what I do is I plug that value in for the variable X in the subsequent computation. So the idea is that it's explicit sequencing and it's driven by type. That's what's sort of nice about using the lax modality. It's not imposed from the outside. It's something you can express internally by how you use the type structure. Okay, so now let's come back to diversions. So far, I haven't written down anything that lets you write a loop. So the thing that lets you write a loop is fix, and I'm gonna reposition fix ever so slightly. And the way in which I'm gonna reposition it is the following thing. It's not applicable uniformly for any type tau. It's applicable only to tabs that are of the form tau comp. That's the important thing. It's computations that are recursive, not values. That is the, that is the general idea. Okay, so you'll see it's exactly the same rule that I had before, except previously there were no comps hanging around. I just said x colon tau, e colon tau, then fixes tau. I don't want that. Okay, this will, I can clear that. Yep. Uh, I don't want that. 
I want to say fix is applicable only to computation. And the fix is a value, NB, this is a value. Therefore, divergence is a value because divergence I define to be fix x. It, it would be written here as fix x return x. I put in the return in my notational setup. That's the infinite loop because it says, well, I want to, the way I'm going to run this is I'm going to return whatever it is I'm trying to return. So it's a loop. So the point is, and then I'll explain why it loops right here, but the point is that, that divergence is a value. So what is going on in by value, by name languages is that divergence is a form of value. It is not, uh, it's not what you think it is. And if you look in fact, in the way these things are compiled, if you wanna know how they're compiled, it's exactly using this modality because in order to pass something to a variable, you must create something called a thunk or a closure or an encapsulated computation. That's what you do. Um, and so this is how we resolve the implementation intuitions that you may have with the apparently weird scenario here about the range of significance of a variable. Okay, so what I do is I do that and the fix is a value. And then how do I do a bind? I unroll when I do a bind. This becomes a form, excuse me, this becomes a value. Uh, this becomes, in this setup, the fix is a value of type tau comp. And bind is something that takes something of type tau comp. So it could be fix, I've already evaluated it. And then how do I do it? I unroll it. Okay, that is the that is the idea. And the unrolling, the body, oh, this sh should have said M. Uh, I, I kept looking at this thinking, uh, no, no, uh, this should say E, pardon me. I, I am a little bit out of sync with my own notation. Good, uh, that should have said E there, pardon me. Uh, and that would be the same here because I'm making it all of type tau comp. So now I unroll it as I do before at the moment that you bind it. So the point is that binding is a sequencing operation and I'm explicitly sequencing the possibility of anything that is possibly divergent, namely a fix, that's the only source of diversion in this very little language. Whenever I touch that, I touch it with a bind and I'm explicitly saying, do this now before you continue doing these other things. So the idea is it's explicit, it's uh, explicit sequencing. Okay, thing I wanna get across is this is explicit, that is type-driven sequencing. That is what is happening. Okay, so the lax modality with this intro and a limb form given here with the return and the bind is the way in which we impose sequencing. In other words, it's a lot like a semicolon and in, in imperative programming languages. And next lecture, I'll get to that. I'll make that, I'll make that explicit. Okay, so this is what I'm doing here. So this is how, how you make that, how you make that all work. So now to go back to what I said before, if we revisit these issues of by name and by value, what's happening is if I took NAT, uh, it's really NAT comp, it's a computation. And because it's a different type, then I don't, or if bool is bool comp, I don't have to, I wouldn't expect mathematical induction to apply to something of type blah, 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 blah comp, whatever that is because mathematical induction applies to a variable type nat, but in a by name language, all variables have type nat comp. In other words, the natural numbers are inaccessible to you because everything is, in, is made into a computation. Ooh, so that is a very unpleasant thing because now uh, that's why I can never get access to mathematical induction and why if I wanted to prove a property of a function, that seems to be on the natural numbers, it's not. It's actually on that comp. And so of course I can't reason about it by induction. So this is a way of explaining the phenomenon that you have that, that languages with that kind of a semantics lack expressive power because the whole rafter of types that you really care about, trees, you know, various kinds of data structures, lists, Okay, natural numbers, Boolean, they're all completely unavailable to you because they all at the very least have divergence involved. And why? Because they're not what they say they are, they're computation. Okay, encapsulated computation. <laughs> so this is, this is how the, I'm just saying this is, like if you look at it this way, then these phenomena fall out. 
that's the that's the point I'm I'm trying to bring across. I think there was a, someone attempting to question, or it might have been an accident. I'm not sure. Uh, no, I, I just want I would just yeah, if, 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 just one comment. I mean, I think the statement you've made that you know the the NAT comp is not the same as NAT is somehow seems very eliminating to me because uh, one one psychological trouble I always had with lambda calculus was the notion of numbers as essentially you know this. Uh, uh, forgot, forgot what it's called, but yeah, I mean, that, that gave me trouble. It's, this seems to make a lot more, um, psychologically it seems more, um, just, just, just a comment, nothing. Yeah, choice in code and numerals, exactly, exactly. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so just want to say thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, Professor, sorry, yeah, it, just, it was just a comment, nothing, nothing more to say. This, okay, this quite... thank you for that. Okay, so all I wanted to do was like, make it apparent that some mystery because there's, there's a thing that tends to be sort of controversial in a way that I don't, it shouldn't be controversial, it's just a fact. And, and it, I think it's because of the misleading notation, you know, by calling things that that aren't, you're just asking for trouble. So if you work in this unified PCF, you can, it throws into your eye the distinctions that matter and why certain things fall the way they do. Now, in contrast, if you look at by value, I have complete access to that. I'm not stuck with passing around computation because I don't, I'm not in a position of trying to say, oh, all my variables range over possibly diverging computations. That screws me. But if I do it by value, then I can get computation by looking at the type NAT comp. So I'm happy to do that. But I can also just look at NAT. And so, for example, the type of partial function from NAT to NAT really has domain NAT but its result is not comp because after all, a partial function when applied might diverge. So the point is now mathematical induction is applicable because the domain really is not. It's not some kind of weird version not like thing that has divergences all over the place. So, uh, so the lesson here that I want to, that I want to draw is simply that, um, well, Type structure is a very useful device for understanding programming language concepts and understanding their implications and how languages work and why they are the way they are. As a relatively minor point, my argument that I'm making, that that's my major argument, that's what I wish to get across to you. My sub point or my minor point is imposing by name is a really bad idea because it robs you of expressive power. I can have, by having an explicit computation type, I, so to speak, if you don't mind me anthropomorphizing, I can have everything you have and more. How can that be bad? How can that be worse? That, well, it can't be, it's not, okay? So I can have all your co-inductive types. I can have all, uh, all the things I want. And I also have inductive types, but you don't. So I win, okay? So this is the argument for why it's better to work with this kind of setting that I'm describing here in which your variables range over values because after all, that's all they can possibly range over anyway. And the internally, this is exactly what compilers do. That's how it's really done. So this is the actual truth. And if you want to expand on this a little bit, you'll notice that for example, in language like Haskell, this, from the perspective I uh, illustrated here, you have only access you don't have access to the computation level. You don't have any way of actually inducing execution. If you write down in Haskell factorial of 5 million, it's a lazy language. So what is the answer? Well, everything's a value. It says, oh, that's very nice, good for you. You wrote down factorial of 5 million. So when does anything actually get run? Well, the interactive level is the command level that I'm describing here, or the computation level, the M. And whenever you type in like factorial 5 million, that's a value. But the interactive top level binds it and goes ahead and returns that value. It would be nicer if the language exposed that to make it accessible to you. And then you don't have these weirdnesses. And another weirdness will come up in connection with, with IO, what is called IO in Haskell. And I'll come back to that next time. All right. so. Anyway, my main point is that uh, I'm using type structure here to make fine distinctions that are useful from a programming point of view. And I'm hoping that these will also help you to understand some 
uh, arguments that go off the rails about by name and by value. And I, I want to like give you a framework in which you can see what's actually happening. And then there's nothing, you know, it's just things are what they are. It's just the way it is. So, so I just want to want to mention that. So the key here was the modality, and I will. Uh, okay, that, that's so I'll leave that right now. So now, what I want to do, uh, my timing is good. I'm I'm happy to entertain questions. Or Harrison, you've been monitoring the chat. I hope if there's anything you want to digest here, this would be a good moment to do that. Otherwise, I want to now riff on this idea in several ways. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, I want to sort of half talk about it, is I want to talk about exceptions because they're absolutely germane to everything I just said. One of the things you notice with a, uh, in a by name language like PCF by name is if you were to have exceptions and inevitably you must. So you have to just accept the premise that you want exceptions. If you somehow think that you don't, okay, then I'm not really addressing you, but honestly, you're going to want to have exceptions in your language. And in fact, Haskell, for example, does. So as soon as you have exceptions in your language in a by name setting, they're very problematic. Why? Because encapsulated exceptions get strewn in your data structures in your program. And they're kind of landmines that are sitting in your data structure that are just waiting to go off. So what happens to you is that when you touch them, suddenly the exception is raised and you don't even know why did that ever even arise because you know a million years ago, so to speak, in program time, I somehow created a value that had embedded with it a raising of an exception, which didn't occur because it was an encapsulated computation. And it's only when I touched it later, rather incidentally, that I found out that, oh, there's an exception there. So an example might be maintaining some contact database and the address field for Robert Harper actually has an exception bomb waiting to go off. If you never look up Robert Harper, you'll never get the exception. But if you do look up Robert Harper, boom, the exception will go off. What is the reason for that exception? Well, God knows. Okay, that happened a million years ago. So this is a phenomenon that's well known. It's this kind of landmine phenomenon. And it's a consequence of, of, of you know, not being clear about computations and values. That's what I think is important. So, so the thing I want to do here is I want to say, no, 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 rather than just try to lump everything in and speak about call by name, let's instead integrate exceptions into the mechanism of computation so that we now have, this is an idea due to Nickman and, and Andrew Kennedy that I really like, so I wanna mention their names. I think it's a very nice idea. Is that what you, the right way to think about this is if you wanna be using exceptions, you better sequence your computation. It's the same ideas with divergence. If you can't get any control over divergence, you don't know when divergence is going to happen. It's very problematic, okay? So exceptions are kind of, you might say, it's an explicit form of divergence. I explicitly decline to return a value. Okay, that's what is happening. So the, the, the idea from, from, from Andrew and Nick is that what you should do then is think of it as an alternative form of computation, and we should integrate exceptions into bind, and it leads to a very elegant idea. And the very elegant idea, I've written, I've written it as bind otherwise to remind you. It's exactly like bind, except that in addition to having return as a primitive form of computation, I also have raise. Now, what it's raising is a value of type X, and I'm not going to worry about right now what that type should be. If I have time, which I may well not, I will, uh, I will speak to you about the idea of exceptions being shared secrets, because there's another gigantic bugaboo about exceptions in the literature that I think is all wrongheaded. And if you, the right way to do it is to think about exceptions have everything to do with encryption. I'll get back to that possibly later. So for right now, let's not worry about what EXN is. You have some type, which are the values associated with the exception. If you want, you could think of it as some string type, if you want. You just say raise, something has gone wrong as a string. But really, you don't want that. You want something more sophisticated. But I'm going to leave that aside. So there's a way of explicitly not terminating, which is to raise an exception. And so what you do is you just generalize bind so that it has a normal return, which is what happens when you do a return. 
and it has an exceptional return, which is one which is what happens when you consciously decide to not to decline to return a value. That's called raise. So the idea is there are two continuations here, x dot e one and x dot e two. You evaluate a computation. Oops. You evaluate a computation because for the reasons I've been arguing, it's useful to distinguish computation that might, well, previously I was saying diverge, but now I'm saying they might raise an exception or they might diverge. I'm gonna keep riffing on this, but for right now we do that. And so we have the normal continuation, which is what happens when it returns a value of type tau, that's like before. But now in addition, I have an exceptional uh, return, which says, well, here's the XN value that was raised. And I pass that to, um, to oh, they should have said, uh, I have a certain nasty habit here that I have to fix. That should say M1 and M2 because those are both meant to be computations. I wrote it that way above the line, but not below. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, that's a mistake. Okay, and now the idea is, as I've said, if you do a bind otherwise, and you have an encapsulated computation, which has a normal return, and I pass that value to the normal continuation. And if I have an encapsulated computation, which has declined to provide a value, is raising an exception, then I pass that to the exceptional return. And what I pass is the exception value. So that's the thing to notice. And I'm deferring right now. Okay, uh, what Xn is, I will defer because I need other concepts that I'm, are not available to me right now to explain what that's all about. But uh, if, I, if the occasion, if I have the time, I will explain to you why exceptions have to do with encryption. And I think it's important to understand that. Okay, so good. So, uh, all right, so that's just, that's it. That's the whole idea. So I'm riffing now on this idea. So what my riff number one is bind otherwise. Okay, so first I introduce bind, which is a way of sequencing computations. Computations being things that you must handle gingerly because they have uh, somewhat objectionable behavior, you might say. All right, all right. So we handle them gingerly and we have the mechanism for doing that. Okay, now I wanna do, uh, come up, uh, discuss another idea, which is also on the same theme, which is another generalization of BIME, which is the origin of parallelism in a programming language. So let me, let me mention this now. So the idea is that if you think of tau comp, it encapsulates a single computation. In order to access, cause that computation to run and to access its value, if it has one, I have to bind it, which means I have to run that guy to completion and then do something else. So the tau computation, the idea of tau comp by itself defeats parallelism because there's no possibility of doing two things, two possibly divergent things simultaneously when you have this type tau comp, which forces you touch one and then touch the other. So it's inherently sequential. But on the other hand, my God, I'm doing functional programming. The great beauty of functional programming is if I evaluate two expressions simultaneously, nobody's the wiser apart from the wall clock time of when you finish. So in other words, you don't have to worry about interference between these two computations. I just run, I evaluate an order pair, evaluate both components simultaneously. Boom, it's all done. So how do we fit this? The thing is, the point I wanna make next is, in a manner that is somewhat reminiscent of the Benton Kennedy idea to integrate exceptions, which I could do here, but I, I didn't. I could put all of this together in one pot, but I, I separated this out. I can use an idea to Guy Block, a colleague of mine here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, which is you get parallelism in the following manner. Well, this formulation is in fact my idea, but uh, I'm riffing on ideas from Guy. So that, that's what I'm getting at. So the idea is that you generalize tau comp to a binary or if you want a k array form, where instead of having one encapsulated computation, I have two. And those are mentioned by the, by the ampersand. And the idea about the ampersand is it's something like an ordered pair, but the two component, the, but the ordered pair of two, uh, of two, oh, these, uh, the, if I wanna do this properly, I again made the same mistake, excuse me for, for my error. I want to encapsulate possibly a diversion thing. That's what I what I wanted to do here. And excuse me for my mistake. I was earlier today rushing to get my notes together. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. But I'll I'll create I'll upload them correctly later. So I'll do it for the binary case because that 
that's enough. Uh, but you could do it for a carry case for a fixed K. And if you look at the supplementary notes, it's also explained how you would do it for a dynamically determined degree of parallelism. It's all possible. But here I'll just focus on the simplest case. So it's very analogous to an encapsulated computation, which encapsulates one thing. But here I encapsulate two things, which are two computations that might not, neither one, either one of them might raise an exception, although I'm not explicitly handling that here, but either one of them might diverge. In any case, they haven't been run yet. Okay, so they're encapsulated in this manner. And their, their encapsulation is a value, but I encapsulate the pair of them. So it's a kind of, it's again an issue of type structure. If you happen to know about these things, I emphatically do not want these things to be memoized. That is absolutely no, I do not want that. I want this to be two computations that are not evaluated and I'm not doing anything called call by need or by need, anything like that. No, I do not want to do that. Okay, I just want to flag that in case you, you know about such things because I don't want you to jump, jump to conclusions. Okay, all right, so that's a value. And then you Quick. introduce this okay. generalization, please. You want the um, twiddle, you, like you want the uh, computation judgments? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, these therefore should be twiddle, yep. For the exact same reason, uh, thank you. Yeah, then I think I'm okay. Okay, uh, good. All right, uh, thank you. Let me, uh, uh, let me uh, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so the, the heart of the matter is the analog of bind, well, I had bind otherwise when I was dealing with exception, now I have something called par bind. And it's the elimination form for the pair, oops, for the parallel pair. These are, is a pair of unevaluated computations. And the idea is that I'm gonna run both of them, I'm gonna show you in the next, on the next page. I'm gonna run bo both of those components in parallel. And when they finish, I bind their values simultaneously to, the, to X1 and X2 for use in the continuation. It is literally exactly fork and join. It's fork join parallelism, which I can depict looking like this. I evaluate the two components, so these would be, pardon me, uh, these two components, M1 and M2, I evaluate simultaneously, and then I join them. So this is the fork point, and this is the join point. When I start the parbine, I fork, and when I finish the parbine, I join. So this is fork join parallelism emerging as a, a manifestation of type structure. That's not just imposed from the outside. It just falls out and you get to use that according to how you use the types. So now notice what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, so again, I made the same mistake. I, excuse me for my, for my, for my mistakes. I want to have, uh, I, I now want to actually write. So I want to do this here and I should put M's here, pardon me for that. Uh, allow me a moment to do this while while I um, fix my fix my notational inconsistency with myself. Uh, okay, so it's written like this, and then this is this again is M one prime, and this will be M two prime because I'm using that. And now, if these have both achieved being a value, so these are really what I really am. What I really want to say is this, um, I can put here return E1 and return of E2, and then E1 and E2 are both values. That's, that's what, I, what I'm after here. So these computations have completed. So let me write it in a form that's a little bit neater. It's the pair of two completed computations. Both of them are returning a value. Okay, so written like that. Then I just plug them in for the variables because variable range over values in the join point of the parallel execution. And then you need two additional rules when you have to worry about one finishing earlier than the other. And you can do that. And you can also have plus exception rules if you want to do that. Uh, and I will leave these as uh, exercise. So you should look at how to finish this out. I'll leave this as exercises for you. Okay, so we can figure out how to integrate this with exception and figure out how to, what you're supposed to do when one finishes before the other. Okay, because that can happen. Okay, but the essence of the idea of this is that you'll notice now the big asterisk here, the thing I wanna call attention to is 
This one step here represents two steps going on simultaneously on M1 and M2 at the same time. <coughs> this is a very beautiful way using Plotkin structural operational symmetrics, which I mentioned to you last time. It affords me a very nice way to express that one step on a parbine consists of, well, any number of steps on the subsidiary computation happening simultaneously. That's the critical idea. So this is, uh, this is what, is, what, what is being expressed here by, by this rule. So I'm able to express what parallelism is. And I don't, as I mentioned before, because everything is purely functional, I don't have to worry about any interference. And you should worry about like other cases uh, that, that I'm leaving here as an exercise. So the point is, is that the parallelism uh, falls out for free. So it's an idealized, the only thing I wanna say is it's an idealized or abstract form of parallelism because it doesn't build into the language some restriction to like number of processors or something like that. It's abstract. It says, look, in the same way when I'm writing in a language like ML or Haskell or some high level language, I abstract from the amount of memory you have. I don't build into my program that I have one gig of memory. And it doesn't make any sense to build into my program that I have 10 processors. This should be abstracted. It's an issue of scheduling. What is happening when you abstract from storage is you are abstracting from a runtime system, which in a manner of speaking, schedules the use of memory. Okay, and then the same thing is going to happen with parallelism. I'm going to schedule the processors according to the demands that are induced by this parallel execution model that I'm describing here. Okay, so I keep that separate. And if you look in the book, the, the, the we, you can, oops, you have the notion, uh, let me, um, uh, let me, let me do it this way. You have the notion of what I call uh, a Brent type theorem named after Richard Brent. Uh, uh, relates ideal, ideal to, to concrete parallelism. And I'll leave it at that. It's all about scheduling. Uh, and it's called, I, I call it a Brent type theorem after the Australian computer scientist, Richard Brent who pioneered this way of thinking and thinking about Fortran back in the 1960s, you're very far ahead of other people. Okay, so so that's, uh, okay, so that's what I wanna say. I, uh, you know, my lectures here are, are so constrained that I can only give you high level idea of things and I'm hoping to intrigue you to look further into like, for example, PFPL or the literature to pursue the ones that you find intriguing. Okay, so, Here's a, here's a nice way to summarize what I'm saying about parallelism. The essence of parallelism is sequentiality. What? Because how did I give rise to parallel execution? By having a sequentializing construct that says, what does fork join? It says, sequentialize both of these things before you do M. M is the join point. I'm gonna carry on doing M. So I'm sequencing the computations insofar as I can, insofar as I can write down two things that can be done independently. I can't run, you notice, I can't run M like simultaneously or something uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, excuse me, with M1 and M2. This guy cannot be run simultaneously with this guy because it has free variables. It's waiting for those guys to finish. You can't run M until you know what X1 and X2 are. So that's an inherent sequentialization. That's the fork join, that's the join part of the fork join, you're doing this join. But on the other hand, everything is parallel insofar as I don't sequence it. So curiously enough, the right way to think about parallelism, which is being suggested by this formulation, is to think in terms of the essence of parallelism being sequentiality. If a computation depends by a variable on the results of some others, you can't run it before those. On the other hand, if these are independent, then I can run them simultaneously. And it's a matter of type structure to express that independence. Gorgeous. It's really like a very nice way to think because again, it's not a matter of something being posed from the outside. It's a matter of how you write code and having a rich enough type structure to express the distinctions you want. So that's a kind of my lesson here that I, that I wish to draw. Okay, so now what I did is I went from 
call by name and call by value as being two sort of strategies you can do for handling diversions. And I did a unified account of those, which used this notion of binding to sequentialize and made the distinction a matter of type structure, the distinction between a Boolean and a Boolean computation. And then I developed that. And then once I'd done that, I realized, oh, now I can do other things in the same way because exceptions have the same sequ sequentialization behavior as diversions does. You want to know when it's going to happen. So you do that with exceptions. And then I realized, oh yeah, and you can also do this with parallelism by sequencing things in a way that allows the things you're sequencing to be run simultaneously, that's pork join. And it all just sort of falls out for free once you have this kind of framework. So I, I just sort of want to illustrate like some kind of meta lesson about how the types are, are, are always there to tell you what to do. Okay, that's the, the purpose. And yet in this day and age, I still have you know, colleagues of mine at CMU even you know, telling me that types are complete failure and a waste of time and nothing to do with anything. So it's a very uh, uh, startling uh, state of affairs, but there you go. I think I told you last time that many years ago at Popple, you had to apologize for doing types, but it's, it's still true this day. Um, but I will stand by this, that type structure is what is, that is what the structure of programming languages is. So uh, I guess I want to bring that out. Okay, so now I have, we're, we're at the end of my time. So maybe I should uh, pause here. The, the, I, I guess I'll pick this up next time. So what I want to talk about next is to say this, uh, the idea is that the, I introduced this idea of fix, which is what Plotkin did. So I, I am borrowing that idea from Gordon, but the, the, in a certain manner, it's a rather ad hoc thing. I just arbitrarily introduced this idea of recursion. And you might ask yourself, is there a way to derive it from type structure? And the answer is yes. And that's where I managed, I remembered, ah, good. Now I can bring Dana Scott into the picture. It was Dana who figured it out that recursion is a manifestation of type structure. And he brought out what that type structure is. And I'm gonna explain that next time, which is the notion of recursive types. And so that fulfills my, my wish that I expressed to you last time. So I'll do that. I'll do that next time because I think I'm overloading you at the moment. So I will, uh, I will, I will end here. And then what I will do tomorrow is I will pick up with recursive types, which ties in with sequencing and the lambda calculus and the Y combinator. If you don't know about those things, you ought to. And uh, I'll give you a chance to learn what's going on there. If if they if those things are mysterious to you, I will hopefully be able to reveal the mysteries and show you how to think about it. So that's what I plan to do here. And then I will talk about a language that in my books called Modernized Algo, which is derived from work of John Reynolds, which I find extremely instructive, uh, which is uh, actually goes back to, uh, uh, to 1960, as a matter of fact, and some of the achievements of uh, Peter Naur and Edgar Dijkstra in particular. And I will, uh, I, will mention, I will mention that. So that's what I will do next time. And again, I'm riffing on this idea of the lax modality. The lax modality is central to what I'm doing. Okay, so so that's what I'm going to do. So I'll pick this up. I'll pick this up next time. And for now, I can answer some questions, hang out, or we can uh, work on Slack uh, asynchronously, as you may wish. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Could I jump in with a question from chat to relay? Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, what is the difference between exceptions and some types? And some, well, the difference. I can, uh, it's, it's a matter of, it's a matter of cost. I can, I can regard exceptions as a mode of use of sums. From an extensional point of view, that is true. However, from uh, an efficiency point of view, there's much more efficient ways to implement exceptions. And so that's why I break it out as a separate abstraction. As any abstraction, any good abstraction has multiple implementations. So I don't want to say that exceptions are sums. I can say exceptions can be implemented in terms of sums if you wish, but they can also be implemented other ways. And so I want to allow for that. And so that's why I isolate the abstract. I, I, I've noticed several times people bringing up compliments, but 
that notion has no application to anything I've said. This is like something that goes around. But uh, I'll, I'll, we can talk about talk about that on Slack. The transition rate system I gave you is not an example of a reduction relation. Well, I, I will, I will, I will take that back. As I develop ideas further, it will diverge more and more from the idea of reduction. Reduction is a concept in lambda calculus, and it's not what I'm doing. So I'll, I'll leave my statement at that. I could elaborate on the comment, but it requires me on um, about how I wanted to intrigue you. So uh, I'll see if I can manage. I I will. Uh, someone is asking about uh, my provocative remark that exceptions have everything to do with encryption, because they do. But I will uh, I will have to explain that to you. Uh, I don't. I'm not in a position right now to explain that. Good. Uh, argument about the weak and strong typing, the notation I used, the colon and colon twiddle. Uh, I think it's most useful to have to integrate these in your programming language. If you try to hide one, you're going to get into trouble. Uh, Scott Baber is uh, theories and models of lambda calculus. There are quite a few papers, but Dana Scott was the first person to give a mathematical model of the of Church's lambda calculus. And it's all about recursive types. I'll explain, explain that next time. I want to do that out of interest and homage to Dana. So both I want to do that. So that's what I'll do. And then I will talk about dynamic classification since there's interest in that and I've kind of provoked you to ask about that. So if you look in my book, the relevant thing about exceptions it falls under the topic of dynamic classification. So I will, uh, you should understand dynamic classification, very important idea, very underappreciated in my opinion for what it's worth.